integrative approach to managing care, front and center, as the number one health problem, public health problem it is. So to give us the sco scoop on this, HOPE, which is the national pain strategy, and also the benefits of integrative care that the NPES touts as best practice, and where opioids fall in pain care going forward, I hand the podium over to Dr. Bob Twillman, who you already have made an acquaintance with, Dr. Twillman is the Executive Director of the Academy of Integrated Pain Management. In that capacity, Bob is responsible for overseeing federal and state pain policy developments and advocating for those supporting an integrative approach to managing care. Also, Cynthia and I have known Bob for many years now, and I can personally vouch that his deep care and dogged concern for people with pain is the real deal. He is a true advocate. So, without further ado, Dr. Twillman. Thank you, sir. Well, if you look at the schedule, I have 45 minutes. Um, I'm going to try to get it done in 30, which means I'm going to go into what I call full auctioneer mode. I'm going to talk kind of fast. But we should be OK, because I only have about 135 slides. So I think this is what it feels like to many of us these days who practice pain management. It feels like we're on this tightrope over a chasm. And if we fall off, all kinds of bad things are going to happen to us and to the people who we're caring for, the people who have pain. This is the great Carl Walenda walking across a, a canyon someplace. And you know, it, it, it's hard enough to walk across there, but when the wind starts blowing up and down that canyon, it gets even more difficult. And there's a lot of wind blowing these days for those of us who treat pain. And it makes it a real challenge to try to maintain our balance and do the right thing for the folks that we work with. Now, I said earlier that you folks are the experts about what it's like to have chronic pain. I don't have chronic pain. I've sat and talked to a lot of people who do have chronic pain. I like to think I'm a pretty empathetic guy. So I'm going to show you what my conception of having chronic pain is, what it feels to me like it must be. And you can tell me if I'm wrong, if I got it on spot on, if I'm a little bit off, but I think this is what it's like. And it may be a little hard to see. This is Harry Potter with a Dementor, okay? Now you remember what Dementors do, right? They come and they suck the life out of you. They make you feel like everything is as cold as you've ever experienced. There is no light. There is no sense of joy whatsoever. It's, it's like I would call it a soul-sucking experience. I think that must be what it's like to have chronic pain. That it, it is so pervasive and so uh, devastating that people don't have any concept of what's that, what that's like. I'm sure even I don't have a concept of what that's like after all these years of talking to people. But there's good news, I think. What did, ha what did Harry Potter do to protect himself from the Dementors? Remember, they taught him a particular charm, a Patronus charm, right? And he could create this, this creature that would come and help protect him from the Dementors. That's Harry Potter's Patronus. It's a stag. Now, if you look at, this, at the movies and you read the books, what it tells you about the Patronus is that everybody's Patronus is different. If you go through this, the stories, you can see what some of them are. Dolores Umbridge, who's a character in there, has a Patronus that's a cat, as an example. I think the task for people who have chronic pain is to find their Patronus. What is it that's going to protect them from that soul-sucking experience of the Dementor of chronic pain? Everybody's Patronus is different. You have to let it sort of come to you. You got to go looking for it, but you can't create it. Harry didn't create his Patronus to be a stag. It just showed up that way. It turned out that that's what it was for him. So I think that's the task that we're faced with, is how do we make it possible for you to find that Patronus that's going to protect you from chronic pain? And it gets challenging because we're not dealing with just one major problem here in our society these days. We're dealing with two. We're dealing with the problem of prescription opioid abuse. You hear about that every day in the headlines. 
right? And it gets in the way of what we need to do to treat pain. Twelve and a half million people in this country tell us that they misuse a prescription drug every year. And they've just come up with some new data. For the first time, they asked people, why do you do that? And something like 70% of them say, mostly it's because I have pain and I'm trying to find relief. That's why I misuse prescription opioids. And we know that about somewhere in the vicinity of 16 to 19,000 people die every year of overdoses that involve those prescription opioids. And that's called an epidemic. Well, folks, if that's an epidemic, chronic pain is a pandemic. A pandemic is something that's much, much bigger than an epidemic because we have at least 100 million people just in this country who have chronic pain. 25 to 30 million of those people experience the kind of chronic pain where you feel it every single day of your life. And 10 million people are disabled by chronic pain. We know it's horrendously expensive. It's $600 billion a year we're spending on this. So just think, maybe we could fix our budget problem in this country if we got rid of something nobody wanted in the first place. We just managed to get rid of chronic pain. And the other thing that people don't realize is that the risk of suicide when you have chronic pain is two and a half to four times what it is when you don't. So if you start doing all the algebra that's involved there, I think what you wind up with, based on numbers from 2014, is there may have been 28,000 people in 2014 who committed suicide with chronic pain. Now that's not to say the chronic pain was the only cause of their suicide, but it probably contributed. So a lot of times these two problems get played off against each other. If we, have to, if we have to solve the problem of prescription opioid abuse, we might make the problem of pain worse, and vice versa. I think these two things are not different. I think they're very similar. Because if you look at them closely, they're both very prevalent, they're both very costly in terms of economics and the human aspects of it. They're both under-resourced. People are stigmatized when they have an addiction problem, when they have chronic pain. They're oftentimes blamed for having those problems, okay? And they're under-resourced in terms of treatment. And I think the most important thing is that in both cases, people are suffering. And it's not just the people who have an addiction problem or people who have chronic pain who are suffering. It's everyone around them who's suffering as well. So we need to start thinking about these two problems as kind of similar. And maybe then we can begin to find some solutions that will solve both of these at the same time. Because oftentimes it's presented as this sort of zero-sum game. If we try to make the problem of opioid abuse better, the way we do that is reduce, reduce prescribing of opioids. And if you're somebody with pain who benefits from that, well, that's just too bad. And apparently, as you saw in the news yesterday, CVS has now decided they have a better idea about what you need to treat your pain than you and your doctor do, which is shocking. Often it also seems like the only way we can improve pain is by prescribing more opioids and that makes the abuse problem worse. So it feels like it's this kind of seesaw. I don't think it is. I think there are solutions that solve both of these problems and an integrative approach to pain management is one of those solutions. H.L. Mencken said for every complex problem there's a solution that's neat, simple, and wrong. Okay? The problem here is we have two complex problems and everybody is reaching for the simple solution. When you reach for simple solutions to complex problems, that's when you create negative unintended consequences. When you miss the mark, it's a, it's a pattern that we call ready, fire, aim. And there are too many policymakers who are engaged in that. They've seen the problem of prescription opioid abuse. I have to do something about that. Let me try this. Instead of sitting back and thinking for 10 seconds about what's going to happen if you try that. Okay? Again, we have solutions, but they're complex solutions. It's not simple. You can't just say, stop prescribing. Because if you have somebody who has chronic pain who's using an opioid and you take away the opioid, what are you left with? Somebody with chronic pain. So now what are we going to do? Okay. We have to have a solution. The numbers that we get, yeah, you know, CDC loves to parade these numbers out and you'll see 50 different permutations of these and they get everybody confused. But let me tell you, the numbers are really squishy to begin with because they're based on bad data sources. It's hard to know exactly how many people are dying of overdoses that involve prescription opioids for a number of reasons, and I could go into that at length, but just know that the numbers when they present them aren't really as solid as they like to pretend that they are. 
We know that most people who die of overdoses aren't taking just the opioid, they're taking multiple drugs. We know that most people who die of overdoses involving prescription opioids don't even have prescriptions for those opioids, they're using someone else's drugs. It's rarely the person with pain who's prescribed an opioid who dies of an overdose. It's almost always other people who are dying of these overdoses. But who, who bears the brunt of that? The people with pain. This is a great book. It's uh, by a guy named Nate Silver who, who gained some fame in predicting the outcome of the 2008 presidential election and all the senatorial elections that year. He's written this book called The Signal and the Noise. And it's all about how do you pick out what's really going on and not be distracted by all of the noise around it. The best example I can come up with, and there's some people in this room I think who can probably relate to this, AM radio in your car, okay? Those of you who are old enough to remember when we actually listened to AM radio in the car, you know, what, what happens, you get this signal, but there'd be all this static around it. And you, maybe you could fine tune the dial just right and get the, get the clear signal. I grew up in the Midwest, so you know, in the, in the summer, in the evening, I could sometimes be driving around in, in Missouri, and I could pick up a baseball game on the radio from Cincinnati. But if there was a thunderstorm between me and Cincinnati, all I was going to get was the noise. The data that we have have so much noise that we can't detect the true signal about what's really going on. So we have to clean that up. All right, poll of the audience. Thinking about the abuse of prescription opioids, how many of you think that from 2002 to 2014, the number of people abusing prescription opioids went up? Raise your hands. Okay. How many of you think that was pretty much a level rate? It didn't change much. Okay. How many of you think it actually went down from 2002 to 2014? A few. Okay. So this is typical. I kind of get a spread. I think generally speaking, we get more people who think it actually increased. Let me show you the answer. The chart on the right gives you the answer. The top line there is from a survey called the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. It asks, have you used a prescription opioid non-medically in the last year? From the time they started asking that question in 2002 up to 2014, it was essentially a flat line with a little dip at the end. So the answer is that based on that question, we do not see an increase in the number of people who are misusing prescription opioids. The bottom line is those who have the criteria to be diagnosed with an opioid use disorder, what we call addiction now. Notice that that's also a flat line. But look at the graph on the left. That's the number of people dying of overdoses that involve prescription opioids. How do we reconcile that? Why is it we've got one chart that's completely flat and another chart that's going up at a 45 degree angle. It's not because we've got more people misusing the drugs, it's because they're misusing them in ways that are more dangerous. They're using higher doses, they're using more often, they're using episodically instead of every day, they may be using them in combination with alcohol and other drugs, who knows? It's a variety of things, but nobody has bothered to tell us yet what those things are. We need to clear up the signal. Okay, so if we want to get the right answers, we first have to ask the right questions. And part of the problem here is we have not been asking the right questions. The wrong question that's been asked is should we be treating chronic pain with opioids? That's not the right question. It's a very seductive question because it leads you to a yes or no answer. People like yes or no answers, especially policymakers who like to think simple. Maybe they're simple, but I, I, in any case. <laughs> The right question is, in which patients should we use opioids, at what doses, for how long, with which adjunctive treatments, and with what precautions? See, that's enough to give you a headache right there, which tells you, you know, my job is to make sure I'm relieving pain and it's possible to relieve pain, but when I talk to a policymaker, I actually want to cause pain, because I want to make them think hard enough to have a headache. And it's by asking these kinds of difficult questions that we're going to get the right solutions to this. So in 2014, the National Institutes of Health held a workshop. They spent two years reviewing all of the literature about the use of opioids to treat chronic pain. 
They held this workshop, people for two days talked about what they knew, what they had seen. They had a panel of experts listening to all of this and reading all of this, not, not pain experts, just medical experts. And at the end, they asked them to write a, a, a report about what they saw. And this is what they said. What was particularly striking to the panel was the realization there's insufficient evidence for every clinical decision that a provider needs to make regarding the use of opioids for chronic pain, leaving the provider to rely on his or her own clinical experience. In other words, we don't know squat, right, about, it, about the use of opioids on an extended basis to treat chronic pain. Well, guess what? When we go to some, some regulator or some insurance company and we say, we'd like to have you pay for massage therapy, what's the first thing they say to us? Show us your evidence. To which I respond, show me your evidence for the extended prescribing of opioids. Because it's no better. The emperor has no clothes. And I hate to say that to some people, but it's true. We think that it's possible to use these medications they have a place for the right person in the right context. Opioid monotherapy, giving you just an opioid to treat your pain, is probably not the right context for hardly anyone. They may have a role. They may not have a role. There may be other things that work much more effectively. What we need is an integrative approach to pain management. An integrative approach is something that is multimodal and interdisciplinary. We use multiple treatments in order to achieve our goal. We use a number of people from different disciplines who are all working together. Notice that's not your doctor sends you to go see person A who tells the doctor something, they send you to person B, they tell that doctor, person C tells that doctor. No, person A, B, and C are all talking to each other. That's an interdisciplinary model. That's what we need. It's person-centered. You know, they, this is something I had a, a little bone to pick with the CDC when they put out a guideline last year about how to treat chronic pain, is they said that in order for a person to continue to get opioids to treat chronic pain, they must show that they're improving in both pain and functioning. And I said, well, that's nifty, but in my experience, those two are not always correlated because I've seen people whose pain never changes, but their functioning improves, and I've seen people whose functioning's never gonna change, but their pain improves. I said the real goal that we need to be tracking is whatever it is that the patient and their healthcare providers have decided together is the goal for their treatment. That's what we need to be shooting for. The goal is the restoration of health, not the elimination of illness. It's a different twist on things. Conceptually, we use a biopsychosocial spiritual model. I'll talk about what that is in just a minute. We make use of Western medical treatments. We make use of integrative and complementary treatments. We make use of self-management techniques. We'll throw the kitchen sink in there if, if that helps. Okay? So there were lots of clinics that provided this kind of treatment in the 1980s and 1990s. But now it's virtually impossible to find them. Why? because insurance companies don't want to pay for them. That's the biggest reason. They've decided that the costs are all up front when you engage in one of these programs, and all the benefits are accrued over the next five or so years. And if they have to show their shareholders that they're making more money this quarter than they made last quarter, they don't want to spend that money up front. It's a short-sighted view, unfortunately. And we know that this approach is the way to do things. It's more effective, it's more cost effective, and patients are happier when you use this approach. The biomedical model that we use for so many things doesn't work well for pain. So the biomedical model is it's sort of a balance issue. You know, you want your life to be in balance. In the biomedical model, something happens. Let's say you get an infection. So you get a whole bunch of bacteria and it tips you out of balance. So what do you do? You take an antibiotic, all the bacteria go away, you're back in balance, right? That's the biomedical approach. That doesn't work very well for pain because there's rarely one thing that causes pain like that. Okay? It's complex, and there's not a simple solution to it. 
the model has to consider the biological, psychological, social, and spiritual aspects of the pain experience. For me, it's not a question of a seesaw kind of balance. It's much more like balancing a plate on a stick. Okay, you've seen these guys who do that. It's a pretty intricate kind of thing. That plate is divided up into these different areas, the biological, psychological, and social, and spiritual areas. If you get out of whack in one of those areas, what happens? The plate begins to fall off the stick, and you've got to get it back in balance. But bio and psycho aren't just one thing. They're also a little more complicated. The biology includes things like the physiology of cells and systems, how they work together to function with neurotransmitters and all those kinds of things. We have anatomy. That, an example of that would be a broken bone. That's an anatomical problem. That causes pain. And then we have mechanical problems, joints with uh, arthritis in them. That's a mechanical problem that causes pain. And the psychology is not just psychology, it's also three things. It's cognitions, what you think about your pain and about other things in your life. It's emotions and it's behavior. And those things are kind of interrelated with each other, we think. But you, you may be able to intervene on some of those. The first person I ever worked with with chronic pain was a gentleman at the VA who'd been disabled with back pain for 40 years. And all we did to improve his life was to tell his wife to stop fluffing up his pillow whenever he complained about having pain. And we changed the behavior by the way in which she reinforced or didn't reinforce his behavior. That's the only thing we intervened on was behavior. And you know what? Within six months, he, had, he was a new man. He carved the Thanksgiving turkey for the first time in 40 years because he was now able to bend over the table enough to do it. And it's all because she stopped saying, there, dear, you're going to be OK. That was not helpful for him. We also have social and spiritual aspects that we have to think about. So now I'm going to show you, uh, so, so what we do is you know, we try to assess somebody and look at all of those areas. When we're doing a good pain assessment, we're asking about a whole lot more than how much pain do you have on a scale from 0 to 10. That's, frankly, that's about the least interesting question I can ask somebody about their pain and maybe the least helpful. So what we need to do is try to assess all of those eight areas and then figure out where do we have to intervene? Where are they out of whack? Where do we have to, inter to do something? And so now I'm going to show you, you know, integrative approach to pain is really kind of a right brain concept. You know, it's not this logical step-by-step -step kind of thing. It's a sor sort of holistic, artsy kind of thing. I'm going to show you a left brain explanation of right brain concept. So I think about some of the things that we do to treat pain. And this is a, a thought experiment, so I have no beef if you want to change my stars around. You feel, feel free to realign my stars. Think about all of those eight areas that I talked about, and think about each intervention. And how much impact does each intervention have in each area? So for instance, opioids have a big impact on physiology. That's how they work. They change the way the cells in the nervous system work. They have an effect on cognition, your ability to think. Sometimes they have a good effect, because if you have too much pain, you're not thinking very well. Sometimes they have a bad effect, because they can make your brain slow down to the point where you don't think very well. They can have effect on emotion. That's part of the problem, right? That's why people like to abuse them, is because they change the way you feel emotionally. Now look at something like the bottom row, which is Tai Chi. Okay? I think it's got a big impact on mechanics. That's what it's all about. It's about movement. It's got an impact on cognition, because you're really focusing on what you're doing as sort of a mindfulness type of exercise. It has an impact on emotion. I think it has an impact on social aspects, particularly if you're doing Tai Chi in a group, which many people do. And I think it's got some spiritual aspects. So I think what we can do is we can look at all of the interventions that we have available and sort of put them on this chart and maybe we'll begin to, to sort of more logically figure out what we do with folks. But our task really is to say to, this, to each person we're working with, this is what we think makes sense to intervene in your pain, to, to, to give you that unique Patronus, Patronus that is yours. And then we try that, we see how it works, we make adjustments, and we keep making adjustments until we get it right. That's what we need to do. 
If all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. The problem for too many doctors is that for too many years, they've thought they only have one tool, and that's the hammer of opioids, which is why everybody's walking around hammered. <laughs> right? Because that's all they think they've got. So we need to give people more tools, and we also need to make better use of the tools that we already have. We, have, we actually have a lot of tools that work. But getting access to them is a problem because that system's broken too. We don't teach about it in medical schools and nursing schools and PT schools. We don't teach them what acupuncture is, how it works, and who's it good for, all those kinds of things. We need continuing education for licensed providers because they never learned it in the first place and still haven't. We need the providers to provide those kinds of treatments. We need to be sure that they have referral networks so that when your primary care doc says, I need you to see a, a massage therapist, they can pull up a list and say, here's who you can go see. And most of all, we need those providers to get paid so they can stay in business. Because very few of them are reimbursed by insurance. Now, there are five key non-pharmacologic treatments that the VA and the Department of Defense say that every soldier with chronic pain need to have access to. Chiropractic and osteopathic manipulations, acupuncture, massage therapy, biofeedback, and yoga. Out of those five, what's paid for by Medicare? Some chiropractic and osteopathic manipulations for some diagnoses. That's it. Okay. So once again, we have one agency in the government saying one thing and another agency in the government saying a different thing, which is a unique experience. That never happens. <laughs> what we are seeing is all of these agencies come up with guidelines telling us what we should be doing to treat pain. Now remember, all of these are expert opinion because what did that, pass, what that Pathways uh, panel say? We have no evidence, right? So this is what experts think we ought to be doing. And the guideline that came out from the CDC last year in March is an example of that. It's an expert opinion guideline. It's not an evidence-based guideline. What these guidelines say is that the entire problem is we're prescribing too many opioids at too high a doses to too many people and we just need to stop. They also say you really ought to exhaust every kind of intervention before you get to opioids before you use the opioids. Now, I don't necessarily have a quibble with that. I think that's probably what we ought to be doing. But you might just as well be telling somebody to go pet a unicorn because that kind of care is about as available as a unicorn is. So we've got a lot, thing, a lot to do here on, from a policy standpoint to change this so that we can access that type of care. We need a plan, we have a plan. The National Pain Strategy is the plan to get us there. So now I'm gonna tell you what's in this plan and try to do it in a way that won't completely put everybody to sleep in the next 15 minutes. <laughs> So this actually comes out of the Affordable Care Act. This is an Obamacare type of thing. It was part of the Affordable Care Act that was passed in 2009. One provision of that was a directive that a group called the Institute of Medicine do a study about chronic pain and make a report about what needed to happen with chronic pain. So in 2010, the Institute of Medicine put together this panel to come up with that. In 2011, the Institute of Medicine put out this report. It's a whole book, Relieving Pain in America. It called for a cultural transformation in the way that pain is perceived, judged, and treated. Cultural transformation, yeah, six weeks tops. No problem, <laughs> right? That's a challenge. It recognized the need to use what it called an integrated approach to treating pain. So then, do my alphabet soup here, in response to the IOM report, the ASH and the HHS told the IPRCC to develop the NPS. <laughs> okay? So this agency within the Department of Health and Human Services, there's this organization or this, this committee called the Interagency Pain Research Coordinated Committee. They said, you guys need to come up with a plan now to take this report and give us a roadmap. Tell us how to get there. And so the IPRCC set up six different 15-member committees to give them this roadmap. And the six areas that those committees were focused on is what's in that handout that you have on your desk or on your tables, the, that really colorful handout that I'll show you in a couple minutes. One thing that's really interesting is out of those 80 people 
90 people? Six times 15 is 90, I guess. Out of those 90 people, do you know how many of them were identified as integrative medicine practitioners? One. One. All of the rest were from traditional Western medical approaches or they were patient advocates. So these are the six areas. I'm going to take area by area and tell you what they said we need to be doing. Okay? So within the area of population research, what they did was they, they set up objectives within each of these areas and then for each objective they had short term, medium term and long term goals. Okay, so it's a really, it actually is a very comprehensive roadmap. First of all, we have to estimate the incident or the prevalence of chronic pain and of high impact chronic pain. That's a new term that was created by the Institute of Medicine. High impact chronic pain as opposed to low impact chronic pain, right? You may have chronic pain that doesn't impair your functioning very much. You may have chronic pain that devastates you. So high impact chronic pain. We need to estimate how, how frequently this occurs because the data we have on that aren't the, aren't the best. We need to look at the extent to which people with common pain conditions re receive various kinds of treatment and services. What are we doing in response to the chronic pain that's out there? Give us the data. Tell us, tell us what we're doing now so we know that what we've, what we've got to change. And we also have to track prevalence or changes in pain prevalence, impact treatment, and cost over time as we begin to implement new strategies. What's happening? Are we, are we making the problem better? Is it staying the same? We're making the problem worse by what we're doing. So that's within the population research area. Those are the things that they want to have done. So the federal government now is tasked with how do we give grants to, to people to do the research that we need? Are there things within some of the government surveys that we use to collect some of these data? Let's work with the experts and let's figure this out so we know what it is that we're looking at. It's, it's sort of like let's do the research to see what kind of elephant it is that we've got, got here that we're dealing with. Prevention and care. Fairly simple, straightforward. We want to characterize the costs and benefits of current approaches to both prevention of pain and treatment of pain once it happens. Develop nationwide pain self-management programs. Okay. How do we teach people with pain the things that they can do to help themselves? That's what they're asking for. Here. Develop standardized, consistent, and comprehensive pain assessments and outcome measures to be used across all settings. So that when you go to see your doctor here, they collect a certain amount of data about you and about how you're doing with your treatment. If I go see my doctor in Kansas City, they may be collecting entirely different sets of data. And that doesn't help. So let's develop some consistency here so that everybody's collecting the same data and maybe we'll learn something faster than we would otherwise. Disparities. There are huge disparities in the treatment of pain. Certain racial groups, certain um, Ethnic groups, women, tend to be treated worse with respect to pain than people in the other groups. We need to fix that. We need to eliminate those disparities. We need to reduce the bias and its impact on treatment. We need to facilitate communication among patients and healthcare professionals. Really? You think? <laughs> you think we got a problem with patients and doctors talking to each other? Yeah. Uh, improve the quality and availability of data to assess the impact of pain and improve access to high quality pain services. Yeah, we need more of these kinds of programs to provide the right kind of care. That's the task here. How do we go about making this happen? Service delivery and payment. They were a much more loquacious group. They wrote these long uh, objectives, but it boils down to we need to first define what is integrated multimodal interdisciplinary care and we need to evaluate that. How well has it worked? What do we know about it? What do, we don't, what do we not know? We need to enhance the evidence base for pain care and integrate it into clinical practice. Figure out what's the evidence. Let's, let's build that evidence and then let's use that evidence to change the way that we actually work with people so that we can improve their lives. And we need to tailor payment 
to promote and incentivize high quality coordinated pain care. You know what's funny about the way we do pain care now? We do something to someone who has pain and if it doesn't work, we get paid to do it again just in case it works a second time. <laughs> Why not, let's, let, how about we do this? How about we say to um, your, pain, your pain care provider, we're going to give you X dollars to treat this person who has pain. If you do a good job, we'll give you a little extra money. If you don't do a good job, we're going to take away some of your money. It's on you to figure out how to get that done. That's a novel concept, but that's the, where we're moving in this arena is let's base it on outcomes. Let's not just base it on how many times we stick a needle in your back. Professional education and training. Do you know how much education the average doctor gets in four years of medical school about pain? Nine hours. Do you know how much education the average veterinarian gets in training? 90 hours. So if you want to get good pain care, go see your bed. <laughs> it's shocking. This is the number one problem that people go to the, to the doctor for, and they get nine hours about this. I think in some places they probably get as much about tropical diseases as they get about pain care, and that doesn't help you much in Minnesota. Um, so we have to develop new standards for what we have to teach people about pain, and the most effective way to get something taught in a medical school is to change the tests that they have to pass to get out and get their license. So let's work with the people who write the tests to put some items on there about pain, and then we'll have a greater impact. We need to develop a pain education portal. This is what we refer to as uh, uh, pain management education eBay. Everybody contributes all their education to one place, and then when you need to know something, you've got a place to go to find that education and learn what you need to know. So let's develop that kind of thing. In terms of public education and communication, that's an important thing too. Let's develop a national public awareness and information campaign about the impact and seriousness of chronic pain so that everybody that you come in contact with understands how serious this is, that this is really a big deal. Okay? We need to have a campaign promote the safer use of medications. Yeah, we decidedly need that too. So where do we stand? Well, the ASH, the Assistant Secretary for Health, who was doing this is Dr. Thomas Novotny. Unfortunately, he's recently retired. <coughs> Excuse me. But the effort is continuing through his office with the people who are left behind while they're continuing to look for a successor to Dr. Novotny. There is an effort underway within the Department of Health and Human Services to carry some of this out. And some of the short-term goals, particularly in, in the area of population research, have actually already been met. But we need to keep the heat on. And we need to keep the heat on Congress to say this is really important stuff and we need to make sure that the money that it takes to do this is available. And we need to keep the heat on the folks at the NIH so that they can say, gosh, maybe we ought to put a couple of dollars into figuring out how to deliver integrative care instead of spending a couple of that's, that same couple of dollars on the next new molecule that might, might be a great drug. You know? Part of the problem is that almost all the research dollars in pain, and, and aren't nearly enough of those to begin with, they go into this drug development and this basic science stuff, and it's important, don't get me wrong. But why don't we do some research about how to use the tools that we already have? What's the best way to combine these treatments we have to treat somebody who has chronic pain? So that's what we have to do. We have to keep the pressure on to let people know we're paying attention to this. This is a big deal, and you need to get it right, because it's important to so many people. <clears throat> and the other thing that we need to keep an eye on is what's going to happen to our healthcare system, because the changes that are being suggested can have tremendous impact, and I don't think we even totally understand yet what all those impacts are going to be. <clears throat> all right, I think I'm finished. I don't have any idea if I made it to 30 minutes or not, but we're done. <laughs>